morning, um, Mr. Norman. Um, how are you? Well, can you just call me Norm? That, <laughs> Norm. that would react, that <laughs> relax me. <laughs> uh, why don't you go ahead and tell a little bit about yourself, you know, what you did at UC. Okay. Let me just start talking? Yeah. What you're saying? Uh, I came to UC in the late 70s, I think. Uh, came as a head of the, what was then called, uh, Quantitative Analysis Department, was now Business Analytics. Was head of that for five years, went back to the faculty for a few. Then in the early 80s, went to the provost office, uh, first as acting vice provost, but before I became vice provost, they asked me to be provost. Uh, did that for almost 10 years. Uh, in 94, returned to the faculty, uh, had a year leave, used that year to build a program called the Lindner Honors Plus program, uh, undergraduate honors program, mm -hmm. in the College of Business. Uh, did that until I re retired in 2002. I actually stayed around uh, for another five years because the uh, primary donor to the program wanted me to continue being involved until we got the program up and running. So finally retired, I guess officially Stopped going to campus pretty much around 2007, 2008. Uh -huh. And what was the Lender Honors Plus program? What is it? What was the Lender Lender Honor Plus program? What, you're asking me what it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It uh, it's an undergraduate honors program. Uh, each student gets five year scholarship, uh, required co op, cooperative education. Uh, includes an overseas trip. Uh, they now do Europe, China, and South America. We initially started in Europe. The students are gone for four to six weeks. Uh, they spend one week with a university in that region, uh, studying global business in, the, in that part of the world. No, it's a, actually a full semester. The first part of the semester is where they study the global business perspective from the U.S. perspective. And then when they go overseas, they get a chance to see it from the perspective of that part of the world where they are. After the academic program, they meet with companies, and we ask the companies to provide uh, three things to the students. One, uh, an understanding of what their strategy is for operating the business within their uh, region and also within the world. Uh, two, the opportunity to meet with expatriates, uh, some who have come from America and are stuck working in their area of the world. Others who leave that region of the world and come to America because coming to the United States is actually more difficult than going overseas for reasons we could talk about. And the third thing is uh, please make sure the students have an opportunity to see your company and product, you know, what it is that you do as either a product or a service. And if we do 15 or so companies, I think the students get a pretty good understanding of what's happening in that region of the world from a, a business perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, we were, the program was designed jointly by faculty and, and business leaders. Uh, the business leaders were asked to identify what are the characteristics that make a current business program outstanding? What, what is it students should know by the time they graduate? Mm -hmm. What are the important uh, things to discuss? And the faculty committee to put together the academics. A little over 20 years old now and doing very well. Oh wow! And did some of the students that were in their honors, when their honors plus program, did they uh, work overseas too okay. after they graduated? We our hope was that, and uh, <laughs> our hope was I don't know whether you want comic and comic related or not. When we talked about this, we wanted to attract the best students in the region to the program. Mm -hmm. Mr. Linder. For the region, well, that was inside 275. For us, it was like a 100-mile radius, but we never really talked about that. Uh, our hope was that 70% of the students would continue to work in the Cincinnati area, because we thought it was important for the program to take predominantly students from the region who would stay in the region. Uh, about, they never, I think we've done pretty well with that. About 30% stay. A number of them are with companies like Procter & Gamble, but they're working overseas. They're, they're in Europe, they're in Russia, they're in South America. Uh, others have gone off, and uh, uh, in fact, uh, Vandez Jones just came back. Uh, he was one of our early graduates. 
Uh, he was running a company in Africa. He was the University of Chicago College of Business Alumni of the Year last year. He started a company in Africa. It's almost like an Uber for uh, farming equipment, where they provide short-term rentals for farming equipment. Started in Nigeria. They're now in seven countries. Uh, he is now back in the United States and working in the Cincinnati area. So the students have gone off and come back. And there's some interesting stories from what the graduates have done. Oh, wow. His is one of the most interesting. Mm. Oh wow! What other uh, companies? Where are they involved in overseas besides Procter and Gamble? Well, I mean, it goes on. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Unilever, uh, IBM. I mean, uh, uh, I, the, yeah, it, pretty it, much everyone. Yeah, I mean, it's, the students are being recruited all over the country now. Uh, mm -hmm. Every year, as I said, we, our goal is 70 percent here. But every year, San Francisco, a couple of number of companies in San Francisco hire on a regular basis. Uh, Charlotte, uh, New York, Chicago. Uh, we have alums all over the country and all over the world now. Oh, wow. When you, when you figure 25 a year for 20 years, it's now all of a sudden it's over 400 people, up 500 people out there. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't keep track. I can't keep track of them all I've been going to. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, the, one of the other nice things is uh, Raquel Crawley, who was one of our early graduates, is she an uh, accounting major worked at P&G, then worked at one of the CPA firms. She's now back running the program for us, which is oh. kind of neat that we have an alum actually running the program. Oh, nice. Um, what are you most passionate about? <laughs> now, golf. <laughs> In those days, you know, it depended. When you look at my career, that's, it's, it's very hard for me to answer because the early part of my career as a teacher and a researcher, then the, the middle of my career, I was building a department, and then working at the university level, and then finally the, the honors program. And as I mentioned earlier, then uh, went from that to when my son always started the company. So mm -hmm. you have to tell me which stage of life you're asking about uh -huh. when you ask me. In fact, the thing I'm most proud of is the Honors Plus program. Mm -hmm. That has affected more lives positively than anything else I did as far as I know. At least I can see the results of it. Mm -hmm. You know, Some of the things you do as provost is so far removed from the students that you can't see the impact it has on individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're at, in a, running an undergraduate honors program, every year you see amazing things happen. We're, we're young people who probably wouldn't have had opportunities otherwise, uh, not only having opportunities, but then you can follow their careers and, and see how well they've done. I, that's mm -hmm. the thing I'm certainly most proud of, because it's had so much positive impact on so many lives. Yeah. Did you like being a provost? I don't think anybody would like that job. Yeah. Not. <laughs> I had, uh, you can imagine, a span of control of 23 direct reports. Mm -hmm. uh, I, the word, the relevant word isn't like I, I was challenged by it. Mm -hmm. It was a, it was an interesting stage of life where I had to learn a lot more about myself. I had no training whatsoever. Really, my in, my degrees are all in engineering, even though I was working in a business college. Uh, I had no training to be anything like a senior vice president of a, a major university. So it was a learn-as-you-go kind of thing, so it was challenging. Uh, I think we did some good things, uh, but I don't remember a whole lot of times that I would write down and, wow, that was a real joy. <laughs> <laughs> um, why did you want to teach at the university? Boy, that, that all happened by, by mistake. Uh, my whole career is a series of, you know, unexpected opportunities that I took advantage of. I did, nothing was planned. Uh, <clears throat> when I graduated from, from high school, my dad was a house painter. <laughs> the year between my junior year in high school and senior year in high school, and the junior year, my father said, Dad, son, what do you want to do when you, when you graduate from high school? And I'd been working with him for five years. I said, well, Dad, I thought I'd go to work for you and take over the business. He said, that would be wonderful. I spent that summer, 90 degree temperatures, painting the insides of closets with lead-based paint, which was ugly. At the end of the summer, he said, son, what do you think you want to do when you graduate? I said, Dad, I've been thinking about college. And that was my career counseling, <laughs> inside of closets. So that's how I ended up in, in, high school, in, in college. 
I went to Northeastern where I co-opted. A friend of mine uh, who had about the same academic record as I did had a scholarship offered at MIT for his master's and I said, holy cow, if he can do it, I can. Mm -hmm. So I sent out to a number of places. Northwestern offered me a, a scholarship including a stipend to live on. I had a child by then. <clears throat> and said, would you come out and do your PhD? There was a, a government program, National Defense Education Act, that was uh, trying to build more people graduating in the sciences. Uh, I did that. I got to the end of that interview with companies and, and universities and uh, decided that I, I really wanted to teach. I ended up teaching at Purdue. Uh, then I went to Georgia Tech, uh, then I, where I started the PhD program in the area there at Georgia Tech. <clears throat> came to uh, Cincinnati when they offered me a chance to build my own department. Mm -hmm. So that's how that department got started. And then after five years, I decided they needed somebody who, who had some new ideas. I thought it used up everything I had, and uh, that's when I had a chance to go into the provost office. So none of that was none of that was planned. It was a journey of seeing something, an opportunity, and taking it. I'd like to say it was all planned, and I had these goals, and it, it's just not true. Did you do any re outside research besides oh. university? Uh, I don't know what you mean by outside. I did a lot oh. of I did a bunch of research as mm -hmm. a faculty member, and yeah. I did consulting. Okay. So Depending on how you define those terms, I, uh, I did both of those, yeah. Okay. Um, what did you hope students took away from your class? Uh, say again, please. Oh, what did you hope students took away from your classes? I don't understand the question. What did I hope to take away from my classes? Your, or what did you hope students took away from your classes when you taught, you know? Oh, hope students would yeah. take away. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm You're fine. Me. You're fine. Uh, Boy, that's, that's another interest. See, I, I taught some sections with 500 students in, in big auditoriums, and I, I just hope they'd survive. <laughs> you know, I, I hope that it was an introductory class to quantitative uh, analysis with what they now call business analytics. Uh, and, and what I hope they would walk away with, with was an appreciation of how analytical tools could be used, what kind of data could be produced, and how business uh, decisions could be based on that data. And that's as much as I could hope for. Right? There was no hope that they would learn how to do it in a class that size, but they could walk away with an understanding of, of what was possible so that they could use it uh, with some, some guidance, but use it in, in their business careers. That was as much I could hope, as I could hope for. So you're just at the uh, senior and, and, and master's level. You're hoping you're developing the tools so they can go out and do the work. At the PhD level, you're hoping to get them to the point where they can add to the tool base so that the field continues to grow. My my generation was the first generation in that field. Mm. We were the first people to really start to try to analyze big data. So you, you, there was, you know, really those are the stages you were hoping to develop awareness, you know some ability to use, and then finally an ability to develop new tools. Mm. Okay. So it would change depending on what, what class you're talking about. Uh, what was the hiring process when you came to UC? <laughs> I got a call from uh, uh, an ex-student, Dave Anderson is his name, who was then the head of the, he graduated, uh, he's got his PhD at Purdue on the beat. He basically said, they're thinking about building a new department up here. I thought you'd be the perfect person. I've recommended you to the dean. Would you be willing to do it? And I came up and, and took a look at what was going on and said, uh, under the following conditions, I'd be willing to do it. They met those conditions, and I came. So it <laughs> wasn't much of a hiring process. <laughs> they went after me and got me, I guess mm -hmm. is the way to say it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, what were relationships like among your colleagues? Well, <clears throat> again, that's, uh, I'm sure it's an unusual, there were two, well, there were three faculty actually there at the time. Uh, one uh, did not get tenured. Mm -hmm. So when I came there, there were two. And I knew one, one had been my student, <laughs> and the, the other guy was a, you know, somebody I, I got to get, got along with very easily. As we built the department, it, I think it was, 
challenging situation for the faculty because I was pushing them to move out of a comfort level of just teaching and getting into publishing uh, and doing developing sponsored research, which I thought was essential for, for the development of the program. And we were adding one or two faculty every year. So uh, it was a growing uh, faculty. I think the fact that most of them stayed there for a long period of time meant that we, we did it in a way that uh, helped meet their needs as well. And I believe the department uh, grew very well. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how to describe it. It was, a working, it was a working team. That's the best way to describe it. Uh, that's what we set out to develop. There was no, no one really in charge. It was just a group of guys who wanted, well, actually people because there were a couple of females. We were just a group who wanted to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And we did. Okay. Um, how did you feel about the administration, you know, during your time? Well, part of it was I was the administration. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as, a, as a department head and faculty member, I was grateful for the opportunity to develop the program, uh, pleased that they honored their commitments from a resource uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I think just grateful they let us develop that program without a lot of external, you know, complaint or, or they, they, virtually we were we were free to develop the way we thought was were proper, which I thought was uh, very fortunate. You'd have to ask somebody else how they felt <laughs> <laughs> when I was there. <laughs> I mean, did you like that freedom? Um, oh yeah, I think it's essential in a university. Mm -hmm. I think there has to be some understanding of what the university is, what it's about, what its priorities are, uh, where it's headed. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, uh, within the research, you know, mainly what you can do from the perspective, from the administrative perspective, is, is set, set directions. You know, where are we headed? Where do we want to get? How, talk about how do we get there? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, provide the resources if it's possible to do it. Um, harnessing in a public university, maybe private too, but I don't, I don't know. Harnessing in a public university is how resource restrictive it is. You know, every time the state takes a budget cut, you get hit. And so you're constantly fighting that. When, when, I, when I took over as provost, uh, you, about 40% of the revenue screen, stream was subsidy from the state. About 50% was tuition. Nine years later when I left, it was down to around 25% subsidy, so there's a 15% cut. Mm. It's a, the academic budget at that point in time was somewhere between 300 and 400 million. It kept growing. Uh, well, if you take a 15% cut of, of 300 million, it's 45 million. Mm -hmm. and, and you look at it for a while and you, you say to yourself, so we're going to 97% of the academic budget is salaries. Mm -hmm. So. Where do you where do you get that those budget cuts? Either you replace the funding, or you're taking pretty severe hits on, on, on uh, people. There's, there's no other alternative when 90 percent of the budget is salary. Mm -hmm. So now that wasn't true in places like you know administrative services where they have trucks and <laughs> things like that. But you look at a faculty, you know, it's it's look at that budget. It's it's people. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's small parts of it that are. Travel, small parts of that equipment is predominantly people. So every time there's a budget cut, it hurts, and it hurts being people. Mm -hmm. And that was the hardest thing, mm -hmm. uh, by far the hardest. And I guess as a provost, you had to make tough decisions as far as you, you, do, you have no choice. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and, and it's I almost said something you probably don't want to take. Oh, go ahead. It, it's not good. <laughs> 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 um. Were there incidents or events that were handled in a way that kind of disappointed you at UC? I know you mentioned budget cuts, but... Yeah, I mean, uh, sure. I mean, you know, you're looking at a 30-year journey. There are lots of things that disappoint you. <laughs> Sometimes it's your football team. <laughs> Other times it's a dean that you thought would really be great and turns out not to be. Uh, Other times it's finding that, you know, there's been sexual harassment or racial discrimination that you have to deal with. I mean, there were some ugly situations over the years that were extremely disappointing because you just don't believe people can behave that way. Yeah. And you find out they do. 
-hmm. and then you have to deal with it. So. And how did you deal with those situations? Very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had a excellent person, a uh, female, who, who was a able to, how can I say this, she was, t she was, she was tough. And she could go out in those kinds of situations, and because I would end up being a final decision maker, I, I pretty much had to stay out of the issue of what happened. That had to be done by someone else, because eventually this case is going to be presented predominantly to me, and then I'd, I'd discuss it with the president. Depending on what it was, maybe I'd get the affirmative action people in, I'd get the uh, uh, human resources people, the key people, but. At the end of it, it's going to be my decision. We'll sit as a group and discuss it, but ultimately it's my decision. So I can't also be involved in the investigation. Mm -hmm. And I had a person who did those investigations, and she was excellent. And I think without her, it would have been a different story. I think we handled most of them well. I look back on it now, I see what's happening in today's environment, and you go back 20 years, 30 years, and say, what was the environment like then? You know, cases where you probably would now refer to the police, you just made darn sure the person out of the university and it was done in a way that that person would never teach again at any other university. Uh, but you, there was no thought at those, those times to teach you. And then you got two lawyers sitting there. You got, we have our lawyer, the person involved has their lawyer. And so even they weren't talking about this is something that should go to the police. And you look at today's environment, I would guess a you know, maybe 15 or 20 percent of those cases now would have been referred to the police. That's how much it's changed. I, I, every time I read about one of these, or hear about one of these instances, and you look at it and say, gee, did, did, did we really miss it by that much? But then I think back on where we were and, and what was being expected, I, I don't know. I, I, that's the one thing I, I spend time thinking about, because I don't know. I don't know if we should have gone further in some of those cases or not. I, even today, sitting here, I, I can't tell you that I've resolved that. I, I just don't know. Mm -hmm. I can't differentiate between what's happening now and where we were at that point in time. And um, how did you see respond to your needs, like you know, research, research and money, or grants, or even uh, salary? Well, that's a lot of different questions at once. <laughs> research, uh, when I took over, is Provost, uh, I wanted to at least maintain the quality undergraduate programs. I thought the undergraduate programs were really in pretty good shape, and our goal was to continue to build them, uh, to maintain them, uh, make sure they stay stay good. And when you looked in those days, College Conservatory of Music and DAAP were by far the out, outstanding and engineering undergraduate engineering. You took the three and said, which ones can you put nationally, compete nationally? Those were the three that you could say, yep, we compete nationally on those. Uh, business, education uh, were in a stage where there was hope. You could probably develop them at that point in time. So there was a goal then of maintaining and, and developing excellence where, where we already had it. And then because of resource restrictions, you can't hope to build everything. It's just impossible. So then the question became, well, what else do you try to build? And my, my goal initially was to build the graduate program in engineering, especially in sponsored research, build the science programs in arts and sciences, especially the, the research, and build the two key professional programs for the region, which in my mind were business and, and education. I think we did real well in graduate uh, engineering. I think we did real well in education. I think we did okay in business until recently. I think the last 10 or 15 years, business has finally gotten to undergraduate, to where I thought, where I hoped it would be. So there were some successes and some that weren't. Uh, but you, you set those, you, you set those goals, you set those guidelines, and you make sure the deans understand, mm -hmm. because you know you can't have a dean of a college where you're saying, look, all I want you to do is hang on the best you can, because we don't have enough resources to put everywhere, and I'm not going to and we're not going to put it in your college. And you, they need to know that when they come in. They need to understand that's, that's how it's going to be because you can't bring them in, make these promises, and then walk away. So it's much easier to recruit in the places we were planning to build than it was in the places you weren't. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, we set some priorities. Uh, 
I think we, I think we did a good job building, building the graduate programs, uh, and I think education did, did a, came a long way, and I think business is getting there now. But again, it's a, the idea is, a, in my mind at least, was to, to set some, some goals and directions, and then hire people who could take you there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you succeeded, and sometimes you didn't. Mm -hmm. I don't even remember the question. Was that at all relevant? <laughs> uh, <it> was, <laughs> answer the research form. Um, was there a, like any else, else that they you know respond to your needs well? Um, like you know, trying to trying to get you know sponsors, trying to trying to get technology. Well, but that's all all wrapped yeah. up in the yeah. the graduate programs. Yeah. And you, if you're getting if you're bringing in sponsored research, you're on the frontiers of what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, Dean Papadakis, uh, that's another interesting story. Uh, Taki came in and he, he, he was tough as nails, to, he was very demanding. The boy, he built that program. He went off to be president of uh, Drexel. Uh, he did a great job for us before he left. <laughs> he, came, he came here from Greece for his master's. He did his master's here and his PhD in Michigan. And he came originally from Greece. When he came back on, when he came here as a master's student, that was the first year that the Fraternities and sororities were back on campus, so the headline of the student newspaper was, UC welcomes Greeks to campus. He thought it was him. <laughs> Give me an idea what his ego was. <laughs> um, how has faculty changed over time? I don't know how to answer that. I, I, you know, the last, I've been out for so long enough, I don't know what the faculty are like anymore. Mm -hmm. In my time period, uh, more emphasis on graduate programs, uh, more emphasis on, on what they did for research and whether or not it was something we could hope to get sponsorship for. Mm -hmm. uh, things that in the past where we were mainly concerned about undergraduate education were less important, uh, became more important. Uh, so, but you, you need to keep a balance. You, you can't have, you, you know, the, I used to tell students all the time, the best of the universities in the United States are not necessarily the best places to get your undergraduate degree. If you've got faculty that are so focused on research and publication, they're probably not paying the attention they need to to the undergraduate program. So you're trying to recruit people who have a balance, who understand the need to have excellent undergraduate programs, but also have the ability and interest to build their graduate research and their publication. So you're looking for that balance. You're not looking for the best scholar that's going to, you know, change the world. You're looking for a person who can come in and, and, and I mean, you'd love to have him too, but, or, mm -hmm. <laughs> but what you're really looking for are people who can contribute across the board. Okay. Um, would you say you had that balance at UC? Yeah. I think there were, if I were to summarize a typical department, you had a cadre of folks who were primarily undergraduate oriented, you had a cadre of folks who were primarily graduate and research oriented, then you had folks who, who cut across together. And this, the idea that the, the unit has to be in balance, not every individual. Mm -hmm. So you, you, again, it's, you, you're building a team. Mm -hmm. in, the, in, in, my, in my view, the right department, the, the right, when you, an outstanding department is an outstanding team that works together to make sure all those goals are met doesn't mean that every individual does it. It means that together as a team they make it happen. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's how it should be, I believe, in academia. Whether it is now or not, I have no idea. I can tell you about the honors, my, you know, the Linda Honors Program, but beyond that, I, I'm completely out of touch with the university. Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever stayed in touch in the university? As other, than, other than doing fundraising for the Honors Program, no. Okay. And how, how often do you do the fundraising? Well, it's pretty much continual. Mm. I mean, it's not every day, but um, I meet regularly with a couple key donors uh, who have become my advisors. I meet on a regular basis with whomever is directing the program at that point in time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we talk about what's happening and, and talk about uh, who, who, who else we can approach to try to get some funding. The key, the key, once the program gets going, the key is to have alumni who are willing to contribute. Uh, the Catholic high schools do that extraordinarily well. <laughs> we, we were just learning how to do that. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think that's happening within Honors Plus. I think the, the alums have been very loyal to the program, and they're not making big donations, but you know, you pick up hundred, five hundred thousand dollars a year from a number of your students, and it adds up. Wow. And you need to have enough to maintain that scholarship base. And you think you did a pretty good job of doing that, of uh, keeping the alumni together? I, th no. Oh, no. <laughs> but you're right. I try, I mean, the first three or four years, if you, if you go back on my description of where it was, I, I left after about five or six years when the program started. Uh, Jerry Ricketts took over, and she's the one that, he, I, she, she was on the faculty committee that de developed the academic program. She came in as the academic advisor, let me say it that way. She was a tenured faculty member. Came, she is a tenured faculty member. Came in as the academic advisor while I was out building support for the program. And then when I left, she took over as director. She did an absolutely outstanding job at building the program, uh, getting students involved, Developing the longer term commitment, we we very much wanted the students to be involved on campus. So when they came in, we strongly, my belief, students who get involved love the university. Mm -hmm. Students who don't get involved probably don't. <laughs> and then the whole key to enjoying your undergraduate experience is getting involved, mm -hmm. doing the kinds of things you guys are doing right now. Um, we, we, you know, every year there's one of the, one of the students. You know, there's 20 students, or 25. One's Mr. Bearcat, and the other one's president of student. Con I mean, and what's happened over time is the program evolved as the senior, the junior senior students, the senior, the people who've been in the program for two or three years, take the freshmen under their wing, the freshmen sophomores, and encourage them to get involved. Mm -hmm. And we we weren't clever enough to figure that out, but the students figured it out. And so what's happened has been this continual commitment of students to give back to the university and the community mm -hmm. while they're here as undergraduates, and then you see it continue. And, and not only are they continuing to give back to the program, but they, we get students all over, alums all over the place who are giving back to the communities. And, and that was one of the things we wanted to build, and, and we didn't figure out how to do it, but they did. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think that happened, but I don't think it was because of me. I think Dr. Ricketts really did an outstanding job. She deserves at least as much credit as I do for the program. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you can't get her, you should. You, if she hasn't volunteered, you should look her up. J-E-R-I-R-I-C-K-E-T-T-S. Jerry Ricketts. She would, she would give you a different, a little different picture on that program and, and what it's done. Mm -hmm. A week ago, uh, President Pinto, well, a month ago, President Pinto's uh, person called and said, would you come in and talk to the president? Sure. So we had lunch and he basically said, uh, I wanted to thank you for developing the Lynn Aronis Plus program. You talked about how much uh, visibility it had in the business community, how important that was to the university. And I thought that was really neat. Mm -hmm. And I said, you really need to bring in Jerry too, because <laughs> she's the one that took it over. I got it started, that's true. I mm -hmm. got the funding. She's the one that made it, the, she's the one that took it over. I paused, and the, and the reason I did is, I am absolutely convinced mm -hmm. that I could not have built that program if I had not been provost. Mm -hmm. So if you ask me, am I glad I was provost all other things <laughs> swept aside, yes, because it gave me the uh, entrees I needed to Procter & Gamble, who, who gave us money to get cash to get the program started, and Mr. Lindner, who gave us an endowment so that we could keep the program going. We needed both gifts, because mm -hmm. we wanted to give scholarships the first year, so we had to have money to support that, and then we needed to have money to continue. Between those two, that got there was enough to get us started and, and make it happen. I don't believe I could have had access or credibility if I hadn't been provost and they'd had a chance to meet me and see what was happening at the university when I was provost. So there's a lot of things that happened that were completely, I was going to say outside my control, and I think they were, there, but certainly within what happened to me mm -hmm. uh, that made that happen. It wasn't just, hey, there's a faculty member here who decides to do it. It was that cumulative career path that was sitting there that I think was what made it happen. And I look back on it, and I, I'm convinced, I'm absolutely convinced it wouldn't, have, it wouldn't exist if I hadn't been provost. 
So you, you take that, you put it together with two people who, who thought it was a great idea to have this kind of a program in Cincinnati and had the resources to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And then I was blessed to have Jerry on my side developing the academics while I went out and, and developed the rest of it. <clears throat> and did, um, Again, a team. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, did the uh, honors program have any effect on the city itself, like the city of Cincinnati itself? You know, well, I think it's. I think you got people all over the city that are in positions they probably would not have been. Uh, I mentioned Levandez earlier. Levandez uh, came out of Walnut Hills. Uh, he did not do particularly well on a, as nor did I, on a standardized test. I, I could take standardized tests for the rest of my life and never do well. Okay, I just don't. Don't. Put, I don't. Well, it's a different story. Vandes didn't, but he he had been the president of student government at, at uh, Walnut Hills. There just all kinds of signals about this young man and his potential for, for leadership. And my daughter, who at the time was working at uh, Procter & Gamble, uh, I think she's a really good judge of people. I said, Karen, would you please go interview this young man for me and see what you think? And she came back with, you've got to admit him. And we did. You know, if you look at a standard honors program where, where you, well, your ACT score has to be 30 or above, or, uh, I mean, it wasn't there. His, his undergraduate grade point average was three point something, but what you saw was a young man who just had all kinds of potential. Mm -hmm. So we didn't build the program in the classic honors sense. We, we were looking for people. You, you don't have to be a genius to be a business leader. I'm sorry. I mean, you, you need to have good common sense. You need to know how to work with people. You, you don't have to, you, you're not a nuclear physicist. I mean, it's, it's, it's a different world. He just had all the attributes you want. And that young man, he, he worked at A.C. Nielsen Basies, <clears throat> went from, from there, uh, stayed with them when he graduated, went to China, to Beijing, where he set up their Chinese operation uh, set up in three in three cities. Married a, a Chinese uh, gal that he met while he was there. He left there to go back to, to, to go, go to the University of Chicago. Got his MBA, and I mentioned earlier that last year he was the alumni of the year for the grad for the business school at, at the University of Chicago. Graduated from uh, Chicago, went to uh, Dupont in mergers and acquisitions. Mm -hmm. Uh, then developed with another couple this uh, pro this uh, business in, in Africa with the with the farming equipment agricultural equipment. The farmers there can't afford to rent that equipment. Mm -hmm. So where do you get the money? USA uh, foundations. Uh, you know you, you've got to raise that money from from someone interested in making this change happen in Africa. Mm -hmm. He did that. Mm -hmm. Gates Foundation. Bill Gates Foundation gave money to make this happen. Oh wow! Uh, he left because his parents are ill. And he needs to be home to to help them. Okay, so he's back here. He's already when he got back, he had offers all over the place. He's working with one of the major uh, uh, equity financing firms in town. So, you know, here's a young man. I believe if he hadn't had that opportunity, probably would have gotten into undergraduate school somewhere, but I don't think would have had the connections and opportunities to do what he did. Mm -hmm. uh, and I look, uh, and he's been an outstanding alum for us. He's done a wonderful job for himself. And you look at what he's done, and he's made important contributions. If that company can, they're in seven com countries now. I mean, they start, I think I mentioned they started in Nigeria, and they've added, I think, six others. might be five. I think it's six. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's growing. And, and you look at that, and that's going to impact. Now, this is a young man that I don't know if he would have had those opportunities, but I look back on it, and that's what I think the program has done. I think it's taken people, I would say each class is four or five young people that probably wouldn't have had that opportunity otherwise, and because of that have gone on to do pretty remarkable things. Mm. Okay. Wow. <coughs> so it looks like it, it definitely has... So yeah, it's met my... <laughs> I feel awfully good about it. Uh, and, and it's neat when the students, like Van, he, <laughs> I tell him Van Jones is a political commentator, he's still the Van does. <laughs> but anyway, uh, when Van came back in town, he made, for one of the first things he did was call and say, can we have a lunch and talk? And, and 
it's that kind of thing that makes makes my life good. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, uh, yeah, I think I think the program did well. And it definitely sounds like it. I mean, it definitely sounds like it had tr a tremendous impact on people's lives, you know, and right. giving them opportunities that they I wouldn't think, have. I think there's, you know, you, you see some of the young people because of the situations, family situations they had, would have had these, probably had the same kinds of opportunities. Well, was when you when you see the people coming out of the less fortunate situations where money is an issue, where they're the first, I was the first person to go to college in my family, I know what that's like. The first person to go to college, and you know, you, it's a different, it's a different setting. And, and for having that opportunity for them, I think, makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, how has the campus changed since you started at uh, UC? Physically, it's different. Mm -hmm. uh, President Steg, the whole time, almost the whole time I was provost, uh, Joe Steg was president. He and the vice president of finance were really focused on building the the physical ground, the physical nature, the the buildings, the grounds, etc. You know, not, I fought them half 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 the time I was fighting them because I wanted those resources for academe. I was I was on I did had nothing to do with the medical center. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, one of the f first things I requested was, you know. Get, a, get somebody else to run college of medicine, nursing, for, I don't know anything about that, I don't want to know anything about it, let's get another provost. <laughs> and let, let that person run the, and everybody thought I was nuts because I was shrinking the size, but it made no sense for me to, to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were, they were, I wanted to have some of those resources for, for the academic side. And I think the, the tension between us made it happen because I kept fighting hard enough so they got sufficient resources to do what needed to be done. They kept fighting hard enough that they got what they needed to get the physical campus and I think together it's made, those two things have made a big change. So, so I look at it and I would say continued growth and the excellence of the undergraduate program, uh, areas where the graduate programs have really become quite, quite good. Mm -hmm. And then the, the physical campus itself, those are the things I would say are big changes. And um, how did you feel about those changes that you saw? Well, I think overall it's been very positive. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, yeah, I don't I mean, you, you, remember you're going back to the 1970s. <laughs> I mean, in the 1970s it was a commuter school. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much a residential campus now. I'm not saying there aren't commuters, but much, much more likely that students are resident. Why is that important? Because that's when they get involved. If you're coming in, going to class, and going home, you're less likely to get involved with what's happening on campus than if you're living there. Now, I'm not saying, you know, after the freshman or sophomore year living off campus, but I mean the first year or so, I think it's pretty important to, to get on campus, become a part of what's happening there. Uh, so yeah, I think it's changed a lot, and I think for the better. Okay. Um, how have UC's priorities shifted since you started? We've talked about that a yeah. number of times, but, yeah. uh, you know. Do you think um, UC is more of like a research uh, university than yeah. I think some of it is. Mm -hmm. No no university, I don't care if it's Harvard or Stanford, no university is uniformly good every, everywhere. Mm -hmm. You have programs that are very good, and you have some that are okay, and you have some you kind of look at and say, why in the world are we even doing this? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the number of those in the last category are much less at a place like Harvard and Stanford than they are at a place like Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. But you can't look at any campus and say, gee, the best city planning department is at Harvard. The best math department, well, it's Harvard. The best English department, well, it's Harvard. No, I mean, they're going to be uh, non-uniform as well. They're just differing levels of quality. I think the number of programs that are very good at the University of Cincinnati has increased. I think there's still some that need to continue to grow, but I'm out of touch. <laughs> that, when I left, I know that was true. I think it's still true from what I see. Mm -hmm. I don't think we have the resources to build excellence everywhere. You know, uh, I don't want to get into naming examples because that, that's to nobody's benefit, uh, but I think that's still true. But do you see you see on the upswing? Oh, absolutely. There's no question. If you go back to where we were in '74 and 
who we are now is a very different university. Mm -hmm. And I think you see it in the, in the well, you, it, all the signals are there, you know, much more of a residential campus, uh, the amount of sponsored research has gone way up, the, et cetera. The, our, our PhD students are going to the best universities to teach. Uh, I had graduate students who went to Virginia, to uh, LSU, to Wharton School of Penn. You know, that's, that didn't happen in the, in the 90s. By the time I left, it was starting to happen. So we had areas where the research was sufficiently strong and, and noticeable. Mm -hmm. They were out to hire our students to build their programs. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, at the at graduate level, that's the real test. Are you, are you master's students going to the best companies? Are the best companies here recruiting your master's students? And are the best universities recruiting your PhDs? If they are, you, you're probably doing something right. Mm -hmm. And you, you feel really proud of that, you know, since you made it. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm glad I played a role in it, but mm -hmm. it. The reality is, if you look at engineers, is, is uh, Papadakis. Mm -hmm. I gave him his head. I hired him and said, "Go get him, and I'll, I'll support you the best I can." But you got to make it happen. I mean, I got 20 other, or 22 other places I got to worry about. <clears throat> if you're really good, I don't have to worry about you. <laughs> I can turn my attention to someplace else. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lou Castanella, when he was the dean of uh, education, was the same kind of thing. Uh, Lou was the first African American dean, I think of uh, College of Education. Uh, wonderful, he went to, left us, went to Georgia after, after a while. You, you can't, it's like a revolution. The, the person who lead, leads, the, leads the revolution probably shouldn't lead the country. <laughs> you, you have different traits you need. Mm -hmm. uh, Lou and, and Taki were, uh, were builders. And I think they each did a wonderful job. Because they were so good, I didn't have to, to do much. So yeah, I, I feel like it happened uh, but I don't take credit necessarily for it. Mm -hmm. I think I take credit for putting people in place and, and providing the kind of environment within which they could succeed. Mm -hmm. But you have to give an awful lot of the credit to the deans that made it happen. So the thing I'm most proud of is Lunar Honors Plus. Mm -hmm. I, I, when I, I've told my kids, you know, I, I, I'm 82 years old. I don't know how much longer I got. <laughs> my wife just bought a car that she'd been leasing and the finance guy said, well, do you want a 10-year extended warranty? They said, that on me or the car, you know, I'll be 92. <laughs> You'll get a 10-year warranty, that's nuts. <laughs> it's like, you know, you want a 25-year roof or a 40-year roof, that's easy. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you, you, you just hope it's, it's going to last mm -hmm. and you feel good. But the thing I feel most, uh, I look at the young people and, and uh, I can feel it, I can touch it, I can... I can shake their hand, I can give them a hug, I can hear what they're doing. Uh, none of that, that doesn't happen in the other places that, that I was involved in. So the thing I'm obviously most, most proud of is Honors Plus. And the rest of it, I say, yeah, I was in a position where I could help make it happen. Hmm. That's good. And, and, and then Honors Plus, I, I want to continue to say, you know, Dr. Ricketts is, is the other half of the key. You know, I, I provided her the opportunity. She built the under, she built the academic side. Mm -hmm. We definitely got to interview yeah. her. Yeah, again, I hope so. She just, I don't, I think, I don't know that she's emeriti. I know she's retired. I don't know that they've actually gone through the emeriti process yet. But you definitely should talk to her mm -hmm. uh, and talk to her about her role in it because I think I think that would be the other half of the story, and it's an important story because mm -hmm. I. Uh, the president, one of the things he, I think, I don't know if I mentioned this or not, but one of the things he said to me is every place he goes, people talk about that program. People in the, in the business community talk about that program. Mm -hmm. So it's clearly had an impact. And she deserves at least half the credit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what else would you would like to talk, would you tell me about that you hadn't talked about before? Uh, <clears throat> the, the, the University of Cincinnati was the first and only place <laughs> I worked that had a faculty union. All the other administrators looked at that union 
as something that was preventing them from doing what they thought they needed to do. And it, was, it wasn't pleasant, believe me. I mean, I, I took my first vacation in eight years. And my wife and I went off for a month, literally the first vacation in eight years. And we went off for a month. Uh, we just did a driving trip. We're from New England originally, up through Canada, came down through New England just, just to get away. Mm -hmm. The whole time I was gone, the faculty union were writing letters about a provost who didn't care enough to stay around the campus, you know. My mind totally unfair, their mind. But when I look at it, and I look at what they have done to help make sure faculty get equitable treatment when it comes to salary, that they get fair treatment when it comes to promotion and tenure decisions, I mean, the other side of that picture is equally important. Having been a faculty member longer than I was an administrator, you know, and having seen some of the arbitrariness that was taking place before, if you go back when the university started, you know, it was it was pretty much under the control of the president. He he, he decided what he wanted and he did it. And there was no having that counterbalance, just as the counterbalance between myself and, and the president when it came to academics versus physical plant. Mm -hmm. The counterbalance between the faculty and the administration, the faculty union gave them a voice. Mm -hmm. It wasn't always the voice I thought should be there because the, the, the more active faculty in research <coughs> were not going to be in the union. <coughs> They're going to be off doing their thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it, the voice, but the voice represented the, uh, a segment of the faculty that would be easy to ignore otherwise, let me say it that way. I think it was extremely important, and I worry about it in today's world because I see so much stuff going on, anti-union, anti-this, anti-that, what, what, I, what I consider to be hate politics going on at the national level. But I, I worry about it because you've got to, the people who are in the weakest position need the strongest representation, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and, and that faculty union provided that. So I guess that's the other thing I would say. I think that Overall, you net it all out, the union was a positive thing. Okay. <coughs> um, yeah, that's uh, what uh, Dr. Kretschmer said. It was like the union is probably like one of the, you know, significant events that happened that you see that yeah. was overall positive. I believe so. Yeah. Uh, I, you, can argue, you can argue with the other side. I mean, you definitely can. Uh, but I think overall it was necessary. Mm -hmm. well, I, I think you answered all my questions. Okay. <laughs> Is there anything else you want to talk about? Or? No, no, I think you pretty much drained me. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I was coherent. Oh, you're, you're, you were great. I, I definitely appreciate it. My pleasure. <laughs>